Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. In the interest of compacting a singular career into an hour-long event, and instead of reinventing the paragraph, here's a thumbnail of our guest's career from Sadie Stein's A Bullion Times Review. Edward Sorrell has indeed had a profusely illustrated life. Over the past six decades, you've probably seen as many New Yorker covers, his political satire in the nation, his cartoons in New York Magazine, his caricatures in Vanity Fair. Perhaps you're familiar with Rampart's magazine Bestiaries, which lampooned the political follies of the 1960s, or Sorrell's unfamiliar quotations in the Atlantic Monthly. Maybe one of his many books, and all that's to say nothing of the thousands of sketches and commissions and album covers and illustrations that animate the margins of a working artist's career. Of course, there's no question your chances of recognizing his distinctively wavy drawing style are a lot better if you're what he'd call an old lefty. Tonight, he's joining us and will be in conversation with Philadelphia's own profuse illustrator, Pulitzer Prize winner and former Inquirer and Daily News political cartoonist, Signe Wilkinson. Signe, Ed, it's great to have you back. The screen is yours. Thank you, Andy, and thank the free thanks to the Free Library for hosting these astonishingly diverse and interesting author series events. This evening, it's my high privilege and distinct honor to introduce tonight's author, Ed Sorrell. He is, as you know, with us to talk about his latest book, Profusely Illustrated. And I have one piece of advice for everyone listening. Buy this book. Buy one for every kid you know who likes to draw. Buy one for anyone you love who loves gossip about New York City publishing before the action moved to Silicon Valley, of course. And um, buy one for every friend you have who loves the politics of the past 70 some years. And then finally, buy one for yourself just to remember what great caricature and terrific printing quality looks like. You don't get this on a computer screen. But this is not just a picture book. Anne Close, the editor of Profusely Illustrated at Knopf, said about Ed Sorrell that she knew he could draw, but added in a toast to him, and he can write. And it's true. I've known Ed for many, many years, and I opened this book and was just um, enthralled from the first page. It's terrific. Uh, fortunately, Ed's talk tonight is profusely illustrated, and the, since, since the book is an autobiography of sorts, I'll let you uh, tell him all, tell us all about his uh, fantastic career. Well, give a big Zoom welcome to our guest, Ed Sorrell. Um, sorry. God. Sorry that you can't hear the applause. Um, to start, I, I, I found one of the, um, the interesting start of your, well, there were many things first about your growing up, but um, as somebody who also grew up wishing she could draw, I was interested in your struggles of, of finding someone to teach you to draw. I was wondering if you might talk about just how, um, how you got started. I mean, your mother sent you off and encouraged you, but later on when you went to art school. Yes, uh, I, I, I enjoyed drawing before I went to art school. Uh, that's, that's, the problem was I wanted to draw naturalistically. I wanted, I wanted to draw like my heroes, John Sloan and and Reginald Marsh and all those those artists of the 30s. But the teachers that I had at the High School of Music and Art only wanted to teach me to abstract, to design with flat color, 
And, and then I, when I went to Cooper Union, it was the same story. <clears throat> there were no teachers there who, who painted naturally. They were all abstractionists. And so for three years, I had to, I had to learn to do abstraction. And then when I graduated, <clears throat> I found out that the field of illustration had no use for abstraction. Uh, and uh, I was saved by two classmates, Seymour Quast and Milton Glaser, and I started a studio and, uh, in, the, in the 1950s. And, uh, and our illustrations were, were not flat, were not all design. They were, they were witty, and and unusual, and harkened back to an earlier time. And uh, they proved very successful. And because I couldn't get along with anyone, I left after a few years and started freelancing. Uh, how how come? Freelancing suited you and not working in, in a magazine as others well, had. Well, illustrators didn't work in a magazine. Illustrators were always freelance. They were called in to do a specific job. So you don't work for magazines. You, you get jobs from magazines. And I had no hopes at that point in, in being a magazine illustrator. I just wanted. I just wanted to pick up a job here and there from almost anywhere. And, um, but, but freelancing was, was what I wanted to do. I didn't have a boss and I didn't have to be a boss. So it suited me fine. Well, should we then jump to your uh, your cartoons and illustrations? Sure. And can... uh, well, there, let's jump to one particular illustration which changed my career. Uh, the one, the one with the dogs and the Ten Commandments. Here uh, you go. I got a call from Graydon Carter, who at that time was the editor of Spy Magazine. And um, he wanted me to do an illustration for a story. I asked him what the page rate was and it was too low. So uh, I didn't take the job. And a week later he called to have, to, to take me to lunch. So I assume this was to convince me to work for the greater glory of satire at a low pay. But just in case, I did a sketch because I'm always looking for an opportunity to do blasphemous cartoons. Uh, I, I love doing cartoons that, uh, that make fun of organized religion. So I did this, I did this sketch. This is, this is the finish of the sketch I did. Uh, in which, in which a dog takes the role of Moses and tells the, his followers to heal, stay, come, sit, fetch, call, lie, jump, sick him, beg, and those were the dog's ten commandments. Uh, he looked at my cartoon and and said, uh, gave me a weak smile and said, it's got Lee Lorenz's fingerprints on it. And Lee Lorenz was the art editor of the New Yorker. And what he was saying was, you're showing me something that the New Yorker turned down. I explained that I had never worked for the New Yorker and by an odd coincidence was having, was having lunch with Lee Lorenz the next day. So I gave him the sketch that supposedly had his fingerprints on it. And it, it he showed it to the editor and Lo and behold, it was bought, and I, my first cartoon in the New Yorker was a full page cartoon. And uh, that changed everything. From Oops. then on, um, well, you can go on to the next one. The, the, that was another drawing was... that changed my career. That was, um, I, I was down on, 
down and out at a certain point in my life. And, uh, and George Lois, who was doing the covers for Esquire magazine, could not get Frank Sinatra's repose for this idea of his flunkies giving him lighting a cigarette. And um, so he gave it to me. And, um, and I got scared and did a rendering of this idea. And when George saw it, he rolled his eyes and said, no, this isn't any good. You've got 24 hours to do it over. So I did it over without any tracing and with just did it as fast as I can. And it had a lot of vitality and, and it was, and it made the cover. And because it was in a style that one didn't usually see on the cover of Esquire, it sort of made my career. It sort of started off my career in a different way. I, from, that, from that point on, my drawings were loose, seemingly uh, spontaneous, and, um, and I was on my way. So how did Frank Sinatra like it? Uh, he hated it. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, because it exposed the fact that he was surrounded by a bunch of flunkies who would do anything for this God, uh, light his cigarette, laugh at his jokes and do the rest. And do you uh, it was a very famous article. The article itself was, was written by uh, Gay Talese and it made his career as well. What, what, what's the next picture? Next picture is uh, another, oh, yeah. a, a very, very devout depiction of Christianity, I'd say. Well, that is Cardinal, Cardinal Spellman, who was a, a devout uh, believer in the war in Vietnam. And he was one of those who went over to Vietnam and told the soldiers that they are friends of Christ because they are here to fight the communists. And uh, I couldn't get anybody to publish this. Uh, Vanity, um, <laughs> Vanity Fair was long in, in the future. Uh, the Nation wouldn't publish it. Ramparts, a left-wing magazine on the West Coast wouldn't publish it. But a poster company decided to publish it. But the day that it got off the press was the day that Cardinal Spellman died. Well, so the poster was never never sold in the United States. Uh, one, one store in Chicago had it in its window and got the window broken. So uh, it, it, a copy of it is in some poster museum in Amsterdam, but uh, it, uh, it is not known. Well, uh, let's move on to... Uh, this is an earlier, an earlier part of my career. I was, my, my wife and I did a, a book about people whose name became part of the language. This is Guillotine, who um, he actually did not invent the guillotine. He, it was, uh, I think from China actually, uh, but he suggested it as a more humane way of killing people and it was used in the uh, in the French Revolution. There's a there's a drawing here to show you how my drawing improved. My drawings were still pretty bad. Uh, I don't consider this a particularly good drawing, but I Especially loosened up. Uh, the, the thing about humorous illustration is that it isn't funny if it looks like you had to spend a lot of time doing it. Labored illustration cannot be funny, I feel. And uh, I, I think maybe there's a better version coming. Well, let's see. No, that's not, that's not it, but I'll talk about it anyway. Oh, uh, how oh, about that one? Yeah, that's a funny one. That's, um, that's Truman Capote who was, uh, 
who wrote a story about all the women who he had been been telling stories to for the last he was a social climber and they they kept him sort of like a lap dog and he kept he kept playing up to them and then when he started to write his book he exposed them as what they were and when the story appeared in esquire one of the women committed suicide because he essentially had accused her of murdering her husband. Uh, and this was the cover of New York Magazine. New York Magazine was the magazine that gave me a chance to do funny drawings and, and write funny drawings. And um, well, let's see. And, is this and it was Mil Milton Glazer, who was my partner at Pushpin Studios for a long time. Um, was the was one of the founders of New York Magazine, and they let me do things like this, like uh, G Gerald Ford takes over in Son of Frankenstein, and in the bottom left you see him um, hypnotizing Ford. You will grant me clemency. Uh, they were kind of um, it was kind of lowbrow humor, but I liked doing it. So by this time, were you feeling more um, loose with your drawings? I mean, you weren't staying up, uh, you weren't uh, worried about them like the Frank Sinatra ones, staying up all night trying to get it right? Yeah, I, I realized that uh, I was, I was always scared of drawing. And to this day, I approach every job with a mantra, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. Uh, but uh, it, I'm, a, I'm proof that fear doesn't always strike out. I, True. I, uh, I remember my, my, uh, the retired uh, cartoonist for the Washington Post, Tom Tolles, um, who uh, shared your views on many things would say that when he got up in the morning with a blank piece of paper in front of him and a deadline looming, it was like having two rotating circles of razor blades going through his brain. <laughs> I thought uh, that's the kind of uh, thing that gets you started in the morning. Uh, incidentally, not all, not all illustrators, not all artists start off fearful. And Milton Glazer, who I worked next to for a couple of years, uh, I remember it was quite unconsciously would look down, would stand up, look down at this blank sheet of paper and would rub his hands together like the villain in the silent movie about to attack the beautiful girl tied to the railroad tracks. And uh, he, he couldn't wait to start on a drawing because he knew that, of course, anything he did would be wonderful. Uh, I, I never had that kind of confidence. Mm -mm. Well, look at this. You, it looks pretty confident. Yeah, that, well, actually, the, the line is kind of uncertain. Uh, yeah, it looks like, it looks like I know what I'm doing, but you can see the lines around the leg where he's, you, I wasn't sure which line was the right line, but, but I did know where I was going. <clears throat> there I is, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I love the figures in the upper left. Um, they really are scribbled and yet they, they do exactly what they're supposed to do. Yeah. So they, they, they receding into the background. Yeah, this this of course is Chopin. Of course, I knew and, that. Uh, <laughs> and George Sand, he was tubercular, and she was a cigar smoker. It was a match made in heaven. Mm. And this is some of the work I did during Vietnam. Uh, I was I was a <clears throat> part of a Quaker meeting that 
had been marching, I think we did the first march in Washington back in the 60s. This was already 1971, but that war was not going to end with marches somehow. And that of course is uh, Nixon surrounded by Melvin Laird, his defense secretary and Henry Kissinger, our did, favorite war criminal. How did uh, Henry Kissinger like that uh, caricature? Uh, I, I have no idea. Never said. Never said. What else oh. have we got there? Ah, now there's, there's one of my favorites. Um, this was drawn during the, during the uh, Watergate hearings in Congress. And uh, Judge Sirica had the job of listening to the tapes. When they found out that Nixon kept tapes, uh, he was supposed to judge whether they were pertinent to the hearings. So he listened to all the tapes. And uh, because I was doing it for Screw Magazine, which was a pornographic magazine that somehow or other was sold on the newsstand in New York City, uh, I, I felt I should do something that I couldn't do for anybody else. So, so he has, uh, so in this, he is listening to uh, someone say, that feels so good, deeper, BB, deeper. Uh, BB are so big and the other balloon is saying, thank you, Mr. President. Now, this is blasphemous and uh, I, uh, but at least I didn't have to draw a naked lady on, on Screw. By the way, the, the logo of Screw magazine was designed by Milton Glazer who had the wit to make the E in Screw uh, had a, uh, a an extension. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, a, priapic, how, a priapic E, I think is what you call it. So um, how did a nice little Quaker boy like you uh, end up uh, working for Screw Magazine? I didn't work for Screw Magazine. I did one cover for them for my oh. friend who was the art director. And it was kind of a challenge. What can I do that's that I couldn't possibly do for any other magazine. Oddly <laughs> enough, the Library of Congress bought this drawing and uh, they refused to show it when I had a one man show there, but they did buy it. Well, I never saw it in Friends Journal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did work for Friends Journal too. And that's yeah. Casablanca. Uh, American Heritage uh, had an issue devoted to World War II and they decided that the great movie uh, that came out of World War II was Casablanca. And they asked me to do a, a double page spread of it. <clears throat> uh, you have to forgive me, sometimes my voice goes. Um, so well, I did this, it was, it was one of the very first pastels I ever did. And uh, it was fun doing it. Um, did you feel like you learned how to draw by this time? I I'm knew how to copy by this time. I mean, I, 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 had, I learned how to do caricature. It, it was suddenly in, in the 60s when the Saturday Evening Post closed and a lot of magazines bit the dust, suddenly the only way to make a living was to do caricature. Uh, Vietnam helped, Lyndon Johnson helped, but there was a flowering of caricature in the 60s and 70s. And this, uh, this and one, this one shows your other side of your, you know, your love of movies and particularly the 30s and 40s movies. Um, well, that, yeah, the movies were a very important part of my life and the life of, of all of us in the 30s and 40s. It was, 
it was the escapism from the depression. It was, it was feeding us fairy tales that everything was going to turn all right and that poor girls were going to marry rich millionaires and, and poor workers were going to end up with heiresses. So um, movies, movies were a big part of my life, yeah. Do, do you still go to the movies? I mean, no, not, not during anymore. the pandemic, but I mean, no. now now movies are more like everything's not going to be all right. <laughs> yeah, er, er, every, everything's going to be worse and worse. Uh, no, I don't go to movies much anymore. Hmm. Well, on to. Well, this is uh, by this time I was really drawing well. Uh, and I did this for the Village Voice. It was at the time that Ronald Reagan had a summit meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev. And in case you can't read it, uh, the dialogue goes like this. Gorbachev calls Reagan a capitalist pig. Reagan calls him a communist snake. He says white racist. Reagan calls him a Jew hater. Gorbachev calls him a fundamentalist schmuck, an atheist asshole, Bonzo's co-star, and that, that goes too far, and Reagan grabs him by the tie and says, that's not funny. I, I would just like to point out that graphically, when you say, oh, this, you can draw now, I love your hands. I mean, your hands are as descriptive as your faces are. Well, uh, I was working at CBS and I did a drawing and I, and I went out for a minute and when I came back, I, I heard them laughing at how badly I drew hands. Oh. And from that time on, my hands were always bigger than the face. Mm. Well, I, I were definitely drawn. Uh, at uh, PAFA, which I briefly attended the Academy of Fine Arts here, uh, Robert Beverly Hale used to come down on Amtrak when he was about 180 years old and, and do anatomy classes. And I always remember him doing the hand and saying, if you don't know how to draw a hand, you're losing a huge way, a, a way to express what you want to get across, um, that they're as expressive as the face. And um, I've always looked for hands in people's drawings. And that one thing I really love about yours. My hands have five fingers on each hand. Yours do, do they? <laughs> so do your characters. This is the best drawing I ever did. I did it for a book called First Encounters, which my wife wrote and I illustrated. It was about first meetings between two famous people. In this case, between Edgar Degas and, and uh, Cassatt, Mary Cassatt. Uh, both, both of them were impressionists. And, and after looking at her work, Degas invited her to the, the show that the impressionists were having. Uh, I, I don't know how I managed to do this drawing, but it, it, came, it came out perfectly but from my point of view. It, it, and it was, so I include it in all my, all my shows, in all my talk, talk shows. What did you do it for? I did it for the book, oh. First Encounters. Oh, 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 right. So Got there it. were, um, you know, we had, uh, Hitler meeting Mussolini, we had Garbo meeting Barrymore. We, there was a lot of first meetings, but this, this drawing was the best. This, this is the jacket to a book I wrote about, it was very autobiographical. It was a, about a boy who, who goes to the Saturday matinee and, uh, and ma imagines himself as the character, as the hero in these movies. Nothing more much to say, but I had a little, 
uh, well, there's the there's the a picture of the Paradise Theater in the Bronx, which was the the most beautiful theater in the world, as far as I could was concerned. Well, maybe, <clears throat> maybe the reason you don't go to movie theaters is none of them look like this anymore. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you can't fill them up anymore. Mm. Um, We're on to the New Yorker. Yes, uh, but go back because. Uh, well, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Before this, yeah. Uh, I love the pink hair. Yeah, that, well, a lot of the, uh, the, the, what were they? The punks had had pink hair. This is when, when Tina Brown was named the editor of the New Yorker, she told the art director to to call every every illustrator in New York, practically any any half decent illustrator, to do sketches for her first cover, and. Um, and for the first time in New Yorker history, they would be paid for their sketches. This is unprecedented. If you wanted to do a cover for the New Yorker, you always submitted your sketch. And if they didn't take it, you didn't get paid. Uh, but this was, this was different. So uh, when I walked into, the art director's office to submit my three, three sketches. Uh, his office was, was you could, could barely open the door. It was thousands and thousands of drawings were piled up on the chairs and on the desks. And, um, and she was going to take them to a dude ranch out west to get ready for this big assignment. She had been the editor of Vanity Fair, which was a monthly, and now she was going to be the editor of this weekly. So she wanted a lot of covers, uh, ideas, and she wanted really funny covers. Uh, so when she came back, she had chosen from these thousands three three sketches and two of them were mine. So I was, um, I was on the road to glory with, oh. uh, with Tina Brown. Well, uh, I, uh, I think there's another, another one coming. Well, could I just ask you on this one, um, when you go to draw something like this, did you go look at a carriage uh, in Central Park, or how how did how do you uh, know to draw the carriage and the horse and the? I drive? went to I went to the New York Public Library picture collection, and went to the folder marked Central Park, and um, there may even have been a folder marked Handsome Cabs in Central Park, but I I picked out a few a few carriages in the park, tried to figure out which one to do. And, uh, and I did not do this freehand. I knew where I was going. There's, uh, in case anybody wants to become an illustrator, there are several ways of doing complicated drawings that require tracing of one kind or another. One, the obvious way is to put down the drawing lightly in pencil and then go over it with a pen. The other way is to work out your, your cartoon, your sketch, and put it under a sheet of translucent bond. Uh, that was my way. If you, if you can see a vague outline of what you want to do, then, then you can sort of sketch, sketch this, this vague outline 
on another sheet of paper because you you see through it, and it you cannot trace it the way you do with a pencil line. And so even though I was tracing, it doesn't look traced. It looks as though I'm trying to find which line is the right line. Even though it's pen and ink, uh, it still looks, it, it looks spontaneous. It, yeah, it's got a lot it, of motion in it. Yeah. But I, do, I just want to stop and give a shout out to the libraries and, and just mark the fact of how libraries have changed. When I got um, started in the 70s, I'd go down to the Free Library of Philadelphia in their immense uh, room up on the uh, second floor that was just like you described with, um, you, you just, it was like catalogs of, you know, C for carriage, L for locomotive, and and be able to check out the the actual photographs, black and white photographs, and take them home and 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 help help you draw. Now, of course, we've got Google, so we no longer have um, photo files on the second floor of the free library. But I thank them for having them when I yes. needed them. They were so here's likely. another one. Yes, this is. Um... For a while, I was doing all the autumn covers. The New Yorker always had a spring cover and an autumn cover. And uh, this one was for autumn. And, uh, and it was uh, of an overweight nymph and a middle-aged satyr and who was by that time was reading the Wall Street Journal and smoking a cigar. But clearly, she had happy memories. <laughs> Ed, um, we're going to have to go to soon to uh, questions from our audience. Uh, so can we just spin through the next? And if you want me to stop. OK. Yeah, no, no, just run through them. That's the oh, there's, sketch. Oh, there's board. the first sketch, yeah, I take that's it. That's the sketch. OK, get a couple more. That was the first. Uh, no. The, this one was one of the cartoons I did for the New Yorker. The, the punchline is, before we married, she seemed like the kind who would suffer a fool gladly. Is that biographical? It was, yes. <laughs> Completely biographical. And here we have three Jews, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. Perfect for this time of year. Yes. My favorite actor, Edward G. Robinson. Ouch. Next, we got to move it along. Yeah. And um, well, this is going this. to take. I okay, love this I'm going to read it for you. This oh, part, really? darling, is Greenwich Village. Long ago, your ancestors made the first roads here. You mean cow paths? Yes, dear. And they did it by avoiding steep hills and boulders. That's why the village has such a charming curvy, has such charming curvy streets. Now this is Midtown. It was created by man. Man likes to build cities on a grid. So he blasts away all the obstacles. It's kind of scary. I know dear, but that's what happens when evolution goes too far. <laughs> I love like it that one myself. Yeah. Th th this is from a book uh, about certainties, about people who were certain about everything. And this is Degas again, who was certain that Dreyfus was guilty. And uh, he's, when he was found innocent, uh, he, he cut every friend who believed that Dreyfus was innocent. Uh, it, I, it, let's go on. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, this is a a an etching I did. Uh, Pat Oliphant invited me to go out to New Mexico, where he lives, and there's a etching workshop. And so uh, I did the last flossing. Uh, I don't know what to say about it except it's Jesus flossing his teeth. Yes. We can see that. Yes. Oops. Uh, What's next? 
Uh, I'm having a hard time forwarding. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, uh, Dr. Kevorkian. What's this? Is it Dr. Kevorkian? No, this is Jerzy Kaczynski, oh. a, a Russian writer. And uh, out of the goodness of his heart, he would go to hospitals to read his novels to the sick and dying. Oh, uh, of course, all his novels were about uh, were about incense, uh, uh, incense and murder and abortions and everything else. But it was uh, this is this was inspired by the presidency of George W. Bush. It's Uncle Sam, a cripple, and lost my country. Please give what you can. Uh, and there's my, the jacket to my book. Four more years? Uh, yeah, this is when I was about 12 years old. Uh, Roosevelt was running for a fourth term, and he decided to have a parade on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx <clears throat> uh, to, prove, to prove that he was in perfect health. And my uncle uh, insisted that I come with him. And, uh, and th there he is. It's... How, how Let's old go were you, on. How, how old were you then? Uh, what's that? How old were you then when you uh, were taking? Uh, it was, uh, well, it was, let's see, it was 40, was that the 44? I don't know. It was about 12 years old, I, whatever, whatever I was. Uh, well, it was in the 40s when he was. Uh, well, well yeah, I, he, I, I have a know, similar, I have a similar story in uh, when I was about 12. My father took us down to the Paoli PA shopping center, which was about the least glamorous piece of asphalt you can imagine. And um, uh, he was a, a Republican supporter of Richard Nixon. So got us right up to the fire engine where Richard Nixon was standing. <laughs> and waving to the crowds of, uh, of Pennsylvanians. So th that's the slight difference between your generation and mine. Oh, or difference between the Bronx and wherever it was you came from. Yeah, well, he came from Southern California. I don't know what he was doing on the East Coast. Well, and I'm there you are. And there I am, <laughs> uh, and all the presidents that I made fun of are making fun of me. Uh-huh. Uh, which, <laughs> did you, well, the people always ask, did you have a favorite? But clearly, these are all your favorites. Well, Nixon was my favorite because he was easiest to caricature. But the, I thought the worst president we had, I thought the worst president we ever had was Reagan, and then came and then came Bush, and I thought, well, nobody could be worse than him. And then, of course, came Trump, uh, and I can't imagine anybody being worse than him. But who knows? Uh, are those the end of the pictures? Yeah. Well, let's go yeah. back to your uh, just to keep the book uh, on the cover because this is okay. the book that everybody should be buying. Ah, yes. <laughs> All right. Well. I should explain to people that I did a lot of research on all the presidents and I found out all the criminal things that they all did and all of them did unconstitutional criminal things. So if you want, uh, if you want the real lowdown on your presidents, buy the book. Um, but I, the one other thing that we did not talk about in your book, uh, but the person who um, features uh, really prominently uh, in your career is your wife, Nancy. And you have this beautiful uh, illustration at the beginning of the book, right at the front piece of a, um, 
it apparently you said it wasn't Nancy actually, but it's a, a sort of a, a, it's a goddess. Yes, a muse kissing a frog. And I just thought your um, your inscription in me in memory of Nancy, who gave me the happiest years of my life, was such a touching start to such an abs 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 uh, acid tongued book but or penned book and i i really love what you wrote about her well uh, she did give me the happiest years of my life and she was an exceptional woman and a hell of a good writer too you you did a book together several books together yeah so well you're a lucky man i'll tell the world <laughs> so, Andy, or do we have um, some questions? There aren't many. I think people are just wrapped listening to the stories. The, the only question we have is, um, Ed, do you know the artist Arnold Roth? And do you have any stories? Uh, I have stories, but I don't choose to tell them. Uh, I do know Arnold, and I like Arnold, and he's very funny, uh, and I eat, I like his drawings. I think they're wonderful, but uh, but it's hard to have lunch with Arnold Roth because he's funny all the time, and uh, it's it's it wears you out. But um, he's a but he's a wonderful artist and he's a wonderful person, but he never stops being funny. Well, aren't you, aren't you Arnie and um, Jules Pfeiffer all born within like three months of each other? Well, uh, Jules is uh, three two months older than I am, and Arnie I don't know when Arnie was born. I. Uh, He's, his birthday's right around year two, and I think you yeah. were in the same well, part of New York, weren't you? We're all, yeah, we're all, we're all in our 90s now, and, uh, and uh, we finally have good reason to fetch all the time. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about Arnold. Well... What I what I love about it is that it seems like um, your um, your professions have given you long life, and that's maybe it just seems long. <laughs> I don't know. Ninety two seems pretty good. Yeah, not, uh, ninety two. Ninety two is ninety two is too much. But uh, I hope there's another question. That somebody asks, is Mr. Sorrell doing any illustration work now? The back page of the New York Times book review still? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back to doing the back page of the Times book review. I, I've been involved in other, in other projects, but I'm going back to that, yeah. Someone asked if you had a favorite publication that you worked for. I had what? a favorite publication that you would work for? Well, uh, I thought when I, when I cracked the New Yorker, I thought that I was in heaven, that I had reached the highest, the highest rung of the ladder. But uh, along came Graydon Carter at Vanity Fair. And I have to say that I enjoyed working for Graydon Carter more than I have ever enjoyed working for any other art director. Um, I thought I thought he was just terrific, and I did some terrific illustrations for him. Uh, I I think my favorite magazine is the New Yorker. Before I got to it, uh, my favorite magazine is the New Yorker of the nineteen thirties that I remember buying. And, for 10 cents. And um, I thought it had everything. It had uh, the, the cartoons were beautiful as well as funny. 
and the and the articles were witty and it was just the best i don't know why it couldn't stay i i understand why it couldn't stay that way but it's a pity it didn't what what was um what made or makes Graydon Carter so terrific, so special. What what's his particular? He, he really, really likes the people. He admires the people who work for him. He not just the artists, but but the writers. I mean, you don't know what it's like for uh, an artist to get a note in the mail thanking him for the drawing. And I'm sure writers had the same experience, but it wasn't only the gentlemanliness of Graydon, but he had wonderful ideas, wonderful projects. Uh, and um, and I, I found, I'm not telling any secrets out of school, but when I say that the real reason he left Vanity Fair was because the management insisted that he cut his staff in half and he simply wouldn't he wouldn't part with his friends his uh, his staff so i i thought he was a first rate person and fun to be with a couple more questions about the new yorker somebody wants to know if um, you had any cartoons in the new yorker prior to doing the cover and was the Tina Brown issue the first cover that you had with the punk? Yeah, uh, yes, that was my first first cover. I had uh, I had only done a couple of cartoons before she came. And do I have time to tell an anecdote about Tina Brown? Absolutely. Uh, when. Tina Brown did so much for me, aside from putting me on her first cover and buying every cover that I submitted that through those first few years. She just, even, even the bad ideas she bought, uh, but she was so good to me and she invited me to, to the parties that she threw. And, and she, and my wife and I were invited to the to the Metropolitan Club where there was a dinner for the American Academy in Rome. And uh, I, I, and to me from the Bronx and to my wife from Kansas City, uh, this was uh, like living in a dream uh, to, to, to have this. And I mention all this because after all her kindnesses to me, I did something so stupid. I said something so stupid that uh, I'll never forgive myself. As she, see, when, when Tina Brown called me at my home, it was always preceded by a secretary who said, I have Tina Brown on the, on the phone. So I had a few minutes to, to say, uh, act like a, an adult, because she I, she was overpowering, and I was a trifle frightened of her. <laughs> so, uh, in spite of all her kindnesses to me, so um, but on the on the morning on on the Tuesday after Labor Day, I get a, a at seven thirty in the morning the phone rings, and I'm asleep in bed. I get the phone. And I hear, Ed, darling, it's Tina. And, and you simply got to do, you simply got to do the cover for, we're doing a cover. Uh, we have to do a cover by Thursday about Princess Di. And uh, you simply got to do the cover. And, be, and before I could stop my mouth from moving, I said, Please, Tina, don't ask me to do a cover about Princess Di. To me, she was just an empty-headed twit. And then I heard her say thank you and slam down the phone. And you can really hear when somebody slams down the phone. And suddenly I realized I probably ruined my career at the New Yorker. And uh, 
And another irony to the story is that I had a lunch date with Francoise Mouly, who was, who was the editor of the covers and the cartoons, and uh, she was the art editor of the New Yorker. Uh, and when I met her at the New Yorker, she had uh, a smile on her face that said, I know what you said, because she was, and over lunch she explained to me that she was in the room when Tina slammed down the phone and said, he says he's an empty headed twit and he's glad that she's dead, which of course I did not say, but all the people in the room, and there must have been a dozen people in the room trying to get this issue together, all the, must have gone to back to their offices and called their friends to tell them <laughs> what Ed Sorrell said. Because when I got home, there were three messages on my machine that asked, is it true that you said what everybody said you said? And it wasn't true. Anyway, that's that's my Tina Brown story. Well, now the truth is out for sure. Um, just a couple more questions. We have many more than we can ask here, but I think there are a few worth getting to. Somebody's wondering if you have any comments on how different professions of types of people you've character caricatured have changed over the years. In eras past, you could tell a banker by how they dressed, a teacher, for example. So how, how people have character changed? Well, well, well the, the mean ones got meaner. Well, can I chime in on that? Let's, yeah. let's face it, the, one of the most iconic cartoons in American cartooning history is um, the, the, the Thomas Nast billionaire with money bag head and the uh -huh. striped suit and the, go, uh, the diamond stick pin. And we have Mark Zuckerberg who wears t-shirts from Gap. I mean, who would you, perp and he's skinny. I mean, it's <laughs> the billionaires are failing cartoonists as far as I'm concerned. Well, uh, technology is making it hard too. Uh, you always s drew a millionaire with the tape coming out of the ticker tape, uh, that glass bowl that held the latest tape results, that's gone. I mean, uh, how do you show that the man is rich uh, sitting in his office? Uh, a, a lot of things have changed, but I didn't really understand the question about, about, the, about changing. I, I think it was exactly what Signe brought up, that people's, how have caricatures changed because people's they, people dress differently for their professions. Oh, how caricatures change, how caricature changes. Oh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, there was a cartoonist at the New Yorker who, who was called old fashioned because he still had people, men wearing fedoras. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had to be told not to have them wear fedoras anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the costumes change. Oh, also, it, you know, all these guys are like skinny and physically fit, and they're all 26 years old instead of being like an appropriately old guy with a cigar or something. I just, I mean, it's hard. Yeah, you're right. I, I, it's a problem making fun of, uh, of the rich. Well, there's, one, there's one more, oh, excuse me, one more question that I think is worth asking before I tip it back to Sydney. Somebody asks, at what point did writing become such a big part of your drawing? And do you also think of yourself as a writer? I don't think of myself as a writer. And I started writing when 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 advertisers stopped advertising in magazines uh there the field disappeared before my eyes in in the late 1990s uh i used to make i used to make a lot of money from doing ads for banks or or <clears throat> uh 
and I used to get, there used to be a lot of magazines. There aren't any magazines, print, print is dying. The more people read the New York Times on the internet than they do on print. And, um, and it's, uh, it's, these are not happy days for cartoonists or illustrators. Uh, and the, they seem not to be needed anymore. And uh, the New York Times doesn't even run cartoons. They can't stomach them. Well, I, I think because they can't control them. That's true. It's a question of, of not having control. Yeah. There, See, was, uh, there were a few cartoonists who who would make the paper bend to them. Uh, the guy in the Washington Post, what was his name, Sydney? Herblock and then Tolls. Herblock, yeah, Herblock. Herblock hated the Vietnam War from the very beginning. And uh, when the Post was still trying to be patriotic. <coughs> well, but it was... He, it was repeated again in the early 2000s because the Post was supporting the war, the invasion in Iraq, and Tom Tolles was uh, cartooning pretty much every day against it. And I admired him a lot because he was sitting in the, he was sitting right near the Pentagon where it was all happening. Uh -huh. Did they fire him? No, they did not fire him. They didn't fire her block, which says a lot about the uh, the paper. Yeah then and now yeah how come how come cartoonists are so much smarter than than these than these titans of industry i mean yeah. everybody knew that the vietnam war was wrong the only the only people that didn't know were the presidents oh them <laughs> yes who uh and you know I had always thought that it was Eisenhower who was the first one to send troops to back up the French in Vietnam, but I was wrong. It was Truman. Truman was the one who who back, who sent who sent aides to to fight the uh, insurgents. Uh, anyway, uh, if there's no other question, I'll tell you the story of my life. <laughs> You can buy the story of his, of his life, and it's well worth every penny. Thank you for being with us, Ed. Well, thank you. It's been, been fun. Always good seeing you, Sydney. Thank you both. Have a good night.